If you'll take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, this is where we will be taking our text from. We're not in Revelations, but yet we are still dealing with the same thing, same theme as the uh, book of Revelation is about. It's about the end time things. Uh, so we, we, we're keeping that same uh, theme uh, here as we uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 4. How many of you in here tonight have ever, you've ever built a house or had a house built? That's good, Okay. When you look out there and there's absolutely nothing on the ground, what's in your mind's eye about what you want there? I mean, you can see. Even though it's not there, you see what you want there. You, you have the end product in sight. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to look at some verses here that give us that same opportunity, how you and I should be living uh, Let's, let's begin reading in verse 7 through 11. Let's all stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion Forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we need you tonight. I need you tonight. I pray that you do that. That bring great glory and honor to your name. I pray that, God, you would touch hearts. You would draw us. You would move. And, Lord, we'll praise you and thank you for what you're going to do. I pray that you'd anoint me and use me. And I'd speak what you'd have me to and say that, that you, not say what you would not have me to say. We ask it all in thy name. Amen. Living with the end in view. You know, uh, as we read the letter there uh, of the New Hope Children's Home, uh, I, I got to looking, and, 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 and as I was reading this, hope is not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. And it's not just a wish. No, see, when you and I are discussing the Word of God and things that have went on, are going on, and will go on in the future, that is a, a hope. Not that I hope so, but a hope that I know so. Because see, this, this Bible you and I have, I don't know if you believe it or not, but this Bible is unlike any other literature in this world. Ever has been, ever will be. Because this Word is a living Word of God. The living Word of God. It's substance. It's something that you and I can anchor our souls in. It gives us a foundation. It gives us faith. It gives us hope. Knowing that you and I living in this wicked world, this is not our home. You and I are but pilgrims passing through. Don't drive down stakes into this world because there is nothing of this world that will bring the satisfaction, the peace, the love, the purpose, and the hope as the Word of God will. And it's a hope I know. I have, and you have as a child of God, an end in sight. As Abraham said, I'm a pilgrim passing through. This world is not our home. And I thank God what hope we have in that. Think about it. If we did not have Christ, if we did not have His Word. And all we had was this world. How miserable you and I as human beings would be. Even as a child of God with this hope, 
you and I get focused on what's going out on out there in that world and watching what's going on out there in the news and hearing stuff like what's going on with these kids. Uh, and you know, we say, how could a parent leave their kids and, 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 and one die in a fire and she's drunk and, and she could have lost them all. It's only by the grace of God you and I ain't there. But the end of all things is at hand. Number one, I want you to write these down. Number one, if we believe we are living in the last days, we should live a sober life. What do we mean? What does the Bible mean when it talks about a sober life? It's not talking about someone that's drunk, okay? This word sober means sincere. It means uh, realistic, a well-balanced, sincere life. That's the kind of testimony you and I are to be. Look, uh, and we don't, I don't live the Christian life for you. You don't live your Christian life for me. You don't do what you do for the Lord for me. You and I are to live our life for Christ. You know, as uh, we heard uh, here uh, last Sunday, uh, the message that was preached uh, by Brother Morrison and uh, others uh, where... Uh, can't remember now who it was who was preaching this message, but it was talking about uh, uh, soul winning to everybody. And he thought he had to tell everybody everywhere, every time, and that's not the case. And what, you know, the thing is, if you realize that what you and I are to do is to live for the Lord, that being a witness to others will take care of itself. That is a fruit of it. That is a byproduct of you and I having our relationship focused on Christ. Okay? A sober, sincere life. Let me read uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is another reason why you and I are to live a, a sober life. Uh, we need to uh, uh, be sincere about this. Uh, if you and I were going to join the army, and you get into basic training, and you go through basic training, those of you who've been in the Army, those of you who've been in the Marines, the, the Air Force, whatever, what are some of the essentials that you get when you enter in to the Army? Do you, you, all, do you go to battling clothes like this? No? Do you go to battle in dress shoes? No? You, you get the camouflage, you get the boots, you get all this... Uh, what? what you get a gun. Now, how sincere would you be about that being in the army if you're going out on the front lines and you say, well, you know, that gun is awful heavy. I'm just going to leave it there. Would you do that? No. Why then would you and I not live a sincere, sober life for Christ? Because I'm going to tell you something. Once you, get, once you trust Christ, there's somebody... He knows He can't take your salvation. But there's one thing He can take. And that is your life. And the second thing He can take is your testimony. Your testimony. Your life. That is our enemy's goal. He can't stop someone from being saved necessarily. He can hinder it. He can do a lot of things. But once you and I trust Christ, He cannot take that away. I am a child of God no matter what. No matter how much someone does not like that, no matter how much you may like, I'm a child of God. I was saved. I was blood bought. My name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. And that not of myself. It was all the glorious work of the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ. He's the one that made me perfect. He's the one that made me worthy. He's the one that keeps me. He's the one that saved me. I and you that are saved are a bought with a price uh, child of God. And that price was His blood. So I cannot lose that. Satan wants to take your life in testimony. You better be sincere. The Bible said He is as a roaring lion seeking whom He may devour. Just because we're a child of God does not mean we cannot fall into sin and God bring us home early. This I wish I could figure out, uh, think I had to say this. The Bible says that our faith 
the substance. Do, do you and I grasp that? Do, do we understand what that means? What that is saying? This is what it's saying. That mic is substance. It's something I can hope, but I can see this. My faith, I can't. But it's still something I can hold on to as a child of God. My faith, my relationship, your faith, your relationship with Christ should be the number one thing in your life. Bar none. I love my wife. I love my husband. I love my kids. You should love Christ more than all of them put together. Maybe you're not married. No matter. Maybe you have a lot of things. It does not matter. Love the Lord thy God with all thy what? All thy what? All thy what? So. This is substance. This is something we can hold on to. It should be the most important thing in our lives. I'd like to say my life it was the most important thing every day, all day. But we understand and I know that that's why 1 John 1, 9 is in, in the Bible. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. On a daily basis, we fail Him. Claim it as sin. See it as sin. Get it under the blood. Your faith. Your relationship. Living a sober, righteous life should be the most important thing in our lives. We should live a sober life. Uh, number two, sound-minded. We ought to be, uh, live a sound-minded life for the glory of God. Uh, let's look in, in uh, uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Uh, I know there's several in here could quote that right off the cuff. Let's go to it and let's read it. Because these are words of life. These are words which we can live uh, our life for the glory of God victoriously by. In Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect Will of God. Sound minded. Don't be someone tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that's out there. It ought to line up with the Word of God. If it does not line up with the Word of God, throw it in garbage. Stay away from it. Stay focused on the Lord and His Word. John 16, verse 33. Some of y'all could quote that. Let's look at that, if you will. John 16, 33. The Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 33, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Sound-minded. We ought to be, uh, number three, uh, ought to be settled uh, in, in, in Christ. Settled in our faith. Settled in His Word. Settled in His will. Let's go to... Uh, Colossians chapter 1. Back to Colossians. A lot of Scripture tonight that will help us. Write these down. Make note of them. I think somebody took it right out of my Bible. Can't find it when I want to. Any other time, fall right open to it. Colossians chapter 1. Here in Colossians chapter 1, uh, Paul preaching to the church at Colossae. Uh, I, I don't know if you have a header there over your chapter. My chapter says this, Christ above all. Christ above all. Here's the thing. Is a, we give you, uh, I, I give you these points and sub-points and everything tonight. Uh, in, in, and in my own life, I can do the same thing. If we're struggling with any of this that we go over tonight, you're struggling with anything concerning not doing the will of God, sin, whatever it is. First check this one thing. Is Christ above all? Is Christ in His rightful position? 
Well, sure, he's king. Well, is he sitting on the throne of my heart as king? Is he sitting on the throne of your heart as king? In verse 23, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church, wherefore, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God. It was settled in Paul's heart and mind regardless of where or what situation he found himself in, what was he going to do? Glorify God. It's not always easy. Nowhere in here where you find that it's easy to live and for the glory of God. It's not. It's a battle. Why? Because our flesh, this old part of our body that has not been saved as of yet, hates anything spiritual hates anything to do with the Word of God, hates anything to do with righteousness. It is a constant battle. But as our pastor said time and time and time again, and it records and replays in my mind when I have my own struggles, my own issues, the one you feed is the one that will lead. There's another thing we can look at. If you're struggling... What are we feeding ourselves with? We go, to, we go home. The wife or the husband. Y'all, y'all, we cook. We go to a restaurant. They cook. Do you, what kind of food do you want them to bring you? Hot. That's good. What else? Done. If it's not done, what will it do to you? Let's don't go there. <laughs> What's some other things? Nutritious. What? Delicious. Good. We don't want to take something knowingly and put it in us that is going to make us sick or, God forbid, kill us. We wouldn't do that knowingly. Why are we doing it to our spiritual man? Why would we do that? Just this one thought alone. And I'm not picking on, I'm just, I'm preaching, I'm, I'm going to do what the Lord had me to do. Country music, rock music. Y'all, you hit those things, brother. Things we watch on TV, things that we see out in this world, things that we hear, things that we shouldn't be involved in. And we purposely do that. Look at the message. You can't tell me that we listen to that and we watch that, that it does not affect us. It does. Just as bad food physically will make you sick, and yea, some have died in the past few years of E. coli and all this other mess because of improper kept and prepared food. The same thing can happen spiritually. I'm still going to be a child of God, but I'm not going to live a victorious life. I'm purposely, whether knowingly or unknowingly, by following the world's example, listening to the world's stuff, harming my spiritual man. That's what's going to happen. Just as sure as God's Word is God's Word, it will happen. But the same thing holds true with the Word of God and our relationship with Him. He said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Not only, and we preach that with the negative connotation, don't we? You go out and plant that bad seed, what's going to come up? You go out there and plant that good seed, what's going to come up? Settled a straight life. Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to see this. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Turn back a few books to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll, we'll start in verse six, uh, 15, excuse me, verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5. 
See then that you walk circumspectly, upright, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Again, redeeming the time, focusing upon Christ, walking with Him, talking with Him, growing our inner man. Because as I said, as the Word of God says, the, the, the one that you and I uh, uh, feed is going to lead. Okay, that's a, it's just like a, it's a law. That's what's going to happen. Uh, but stay away from the world. Don't play with it, because you and I are going to lose every time. We're no different. How many times have we told our kids, "Don't do this and don't do that"? Why? Be- I know what's going to happen. Unfortunately, I made mistakes in my own life. I know what's going to happen. You're no different. What are they going to do? That's exactly right. And you know what? We can get on our kids, but if you and I as adults were honest, we still do it in our own life. Oh, it may not be going out of town and doing something just absolutely just fall off the bus, vile and wicked. Sin, sin, folks. It don't matter what name we put on it. Sin is sin. And when it is conceived, what does it bring forth? Death! And it's not going to change. Not in this world. When, are, when am I going to get serious and grab a hold of my faith and, 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 and realize it's, it's substance, it's, I can place my faith and trust in Christ. I can, through the power of God, live for Him. What has Christ ever wanted to do for you and I? Can y'all tell me? What has He ever wanted to do? What's the one thing He wanted? What did He come for? To give us what, Andrew? Life! That's all He ever wanted to do was give us eternal life. And all the world wants to do is give us eternal death. And that's not a death, that's the end of it. That is an eternal separation from God. If you leave this world without Him, Because see, you and I, whether you know this or not, whether you believe this or not, you and I are immortal. Lost or saved. We will either, because of Christ, those of us that trust Christ as our Savior, will live eternally with Him. Those who do not will die eternally with their father, the liar, Satan. Live a straight, upright life for God. Situated life. A situated life. A steadfast life. Number two, if we believe we are living in the last days, watch and pray. Back to our text in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 7 But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Number one, we're to watch for His return. You know, He didn't just say that to be saying that. That's not a suggestion. He said, watch and pray. Pray for others. Watch for His return pray for others. Luke 22, verse 39. Let's go there. Luke 22, verse 39. In Luke 22, verse 39, 
The Bible says this. And he came out, went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. Now, I want you to get there. I want everybody to get here. I want you, I, I, I want you to uh, focus on this scripture here. There is a truth in here that will help you and I. James says that you and I are drawn away whenever man is tempted by his what? His own lust. So we know what to look for, don't we? Here's something that can prevent that. Because God's Word said so. That substance. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at, at that place, at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Did you catch that? Do you know why he told us to pray? Right here is one reason why. That's how we fight. That's how we, we put on the, the, the armor of the Christian. This is how you and I can stop from even getting to that point of entering into temptation. Is praying. That's what He said. And He was withdrawn from them by stones cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if Thou will be willing, remove this cup from Me. Nevertheless, not My will, but Thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly as his sweat was that was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. Said unto them, Why sleep ye? And he says it again. He's repeating it. When you're talking to your children, and you're trying to get a point across. How many times do you say that point to them? Pray, lest you enter into temptation. Number three, if we believe we're living in the last days, well, love fervently. Love fervently. Fervently. Let's go to the love chapter. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we're going to say some things here that is very, very hard in my own life to practice. First Corinthians chapter 13 will begin in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, prophecies they shall. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. You know what he's saying here uh, uh, through uh, uh, verse uh, th uh, 3 through 7? Uh, it covers everything and everyone in our life. Here's the famous saying. <clears throat> I'm going to forgive them. Because, see, we know Christ said, hey, if, if you come to the altar, and there you find, and, and he'll, he'll help you remember it too, by the way. He'll point it out. That you have an all against someone, or someone has an all against you. What did he say to leave at the altar? Leave your gift there. 
Don't talk. Don't do anything. Don't call on the Lord because you ain't right with God. Go get it right. That's what he said. I'll forgive because he said if I don't, he won't forgive me. Well, I won't forget. And now you're lying. I'm lying. What did Christ know about me back before the foundation of the world? What did he know? That's exactly right, Andrew. What, what, brother, you mean he knew everything about you before you were ever, before the world was ever created? That's exactly right. He knew the numbers of hair on my head and the lack thereof now. <laughs> he knew the color of my eyes. He knew everything about me. Nothing that I've done that took him by surprise. He knows everything about you. When he came to the cross, did he cry on that cross? If they don't love me, then they can't be saved. Nope. Well, if they'll do this, then I'll die for them. Nope. When he willingly laid down on that cross and they nailed him to that cross and rose him up and crucified him on that cross, he willingly, knowingly did it for you as an individual and for this whole world. Knowing what we were. And do you know when I stand before Him, and you as a child of God stand before Him, do you know what will never be brought up? Do you? My sin! It was gone! It was washed away by the blood of the Lamb! He will never bring it back and throw it in my face! He buried it. It's gone. For God never to be remembered again. So for you and I to say we forgive, but we did not forget, it is a lie. You're letting it hold you and take you down. It's not, if Daryl's mad at me, it's not about me forgiving him to set him free. I can't set him free. Do you know why the Lord wants me to go to him and get it right? So I will be set free. So I don't live under the bondage and death of my sin. That's why. It's about me, my relationship with him. It's about Him ultimately. That's what it's about. Well, I'll do it. But I'm going to pray that God slaps a taste buzz out their mouth. He might do that to you before you get there. Just follow the Word of God. Yeah, I think of the Old Testament, uh, New Testament story of the, uh, uh, the man, uh, centurion soldier, I think it was. But God told him to sit Go dip in this river seven times. And you'll be clean. And what did he do? He complained, Andrew. The doctor, the great physician was telling him what to do to be healed and he's complaining and arguing with him. We do the same, don't we? We're no different. Love fervently. You and I follow the Word of God. Love covers a multitude of sin. Number four, we believe we're living in the last days. We're going to live a life, a friendly life. A friendly life. <clears throat> Folks, there are people that come into this church, and I want to stress this. I'm not getting on to anybody. I want to encourage you. How many in here before you were saved 
was lost? I better say 100%. That's right. That's a prime. A profound thought, right? I came all that way to hear that. When you come to a new church, lost or saved, how do you feel? Huh? We're kindly shy, aren't we? We don't know anybody. So, why do we get on the defensive? If we'll just get out from behind that pew and walk right over here, you know what we're going to find out? Nancy's a human being just like I am. I don't know what to say. Nothing. Went hard. Well, you know her. I would pick somebody that I don't know, but I don't want to make them feel bad doing it, okay? It's not hard. You don't have to say anything. Just say, hello. Sure good to have you. (coughs) Ain't it nice when somebody does you that way? Sure it is. I don't know why that's so hard. They come in here hurting. Just like you and I were. Maybe we weren't in the drug crowd. Maybe you weren't in the alcohol crowd. Maybe you weren't doing all this vile, wicked stuff that we hear some people that have went through been saved by the grace of God. I don't care. The world's still cruel. The world's still devastating. The world has nothing good to offer. And folks, does it ever dawn upon us that someone walking in that door, and it don't matter how they're dressed, by the way, they could have rags on, they could have Armani suits on. But just as Brother Johnny was saying the other night up there talking to a man who had it all, lost it all. He shared the gospel with him. Two weeks later, he called. He said, I've lost everything, but thank God I have because I'm saved. And John just started talking to him. They come in here and we don't know what point of life they're at. We don't know if they're contemplating that very thing, suicide. We don't. Put yourself in their shoes. What if that was you? Go talk to them. Be a friend. You want friends? Go be a friend. It's amazing how many people will sit right there in that pew and nobody talk to me. Would you get out of that pew and go talk to them? You know, there's a two-way aisle right here for a reason. Get out of the pew and go talk to somebody. Go talk to them. You see somebody new in here? Go to them. That, that, That should be the first person we shake hands with. That should be the first person we love on and tell them we're glad they're here. You need to go shake a brother or sister's hand. Show them the love of Christ. Let them know. You experienced what it was like for Christ, the Son of God, to come to you and love you unconditionally. And you set that example before them. God uses you. Just like God used Brother Johnny. You don't know what just saying hello might do for somebody. I'll do Christians the same way. We Christians get in fixes too, don't we? We sure do. We make bad decisions, don't we? We sure do. Don't take for granted that everybody's okay sitting in here tonight. You may not be doing, I may not be doing good tomorrow night. Go to them. Be a friend. If we believe we're living in the last days, number five, serve Faithfully. You know what the Bible says about faith? It is required. Understand this. He said it. God said it. It is required that a man be found faithful. Faithful. Faithful in our relationship with Christ. Faithful in our relationship with our spouse. Faithful in our relationship to our kids. Faithful in the relationship of a brother and sister in Christ here at church. You ought to be faithful. When I'm going through this, be faithful. You don't know what. Be faithful. 
Dr. Lee Robertson said it best. Be faithful till the stars fall from the heavens. Be faithful. Be faithful. Number six, we believe we're living in the last days. We should glorify our Father. As I said earlier, the Bible tells you and I, whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. We don't come in here, we don't play a piano, we don't play an organ, we don't play a flute, we don't play a trombone, we don't play a violin, we don't sing, we don't sit there in that pew, we, we don't teach, we don't assist, we don't do anything here at home, at work, anywhere for the glory of ourselves or anyone else except God. Not one thing. God gets the glory. Over the years, I've seen groups come in here and groups go out of here. Several years ago, there was a lady came in here and sang. And folks, I'm going to tell you, and it's, it's only by the grace of God I've been here since 89. God gets the glory. It's not a me, it's a Him. But in all those years, I have never felt or sensed the power of God on a person. It inspired me. I want God's power upon me. Now, understand this. Nothing takes the preeminence of the preaching of the Word of God. Nothing. There's nothing else ordained for the preaching of souls to be saved. It's the Word of God. That's it. It's preeminent. Christ is preeminent. We can still be anointed and used of God in whatever we do. Okay? All for the glory of God. God was on that lady. We saw people getting saved. My, it was on, I, I've, I've never seen it since. A couple years goes by. She came back. We had her back. This time, she brought her daughter. And her, uh, the, the, the mother's husband was this girl's Stepfather. They set up and everything. And she came in and she had on this long, the daughter did this long black fur coat. And coming in and everything, we went to Sunday school and then it was time for the 11 o'clock service. And we come in and it was time for them to sing and they get up. She stands up and takes off her coat. Revealing a dress on her that showed every nook and cranny on her body. That is vile and wicked. You do not get up and rob God's glory from Him. At all. And you could tell it the moment they started singing, the Spirit of God was nowhere here. And within one week of leaving here, that family was ripped apart. That's just one example. It don't have to be a visual like that to rob God of His glory. See, God knows my heart. God knows your heart. And one thing He will not tolerate in our life, in our heart, is you and I robbing Him of His glory. Live sober. Sincere. Because the end is in sight, child of God. Do you want to be found watching, looking for that blessed hope and the appearing of our Lord and Savior? Of course we do. Who doesn't? 
There's going to be child, children of God literally surprised and scared half to death when that day comes because they're not ready. This thing called faith in relationship with Christ, it's substance. It's real. The old saying is you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make it drink. It's up to you. It's up to you. What are you going to do with it? The altar's open.